Okay. Hi. Welcome to Attacking Detecting Attacks on Kubernetes Clusters. I'm Jay Beal from InGuardians. And I'm Alana Trimble from InGuardians. And you can follow us on Twitter using the handles that you see on the slide. And we'll put those at the end, too. So here's what we're going to do today. Our talk is focused on the DEF CON Kubernetes Capture the Flag, which a bunch of us at InGuardian started creating and running in 2020. We're going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about the CTF and then demonstrate a start to finish speed run of the CTF, showing you how to attack the Kubernetes cluster, picking up all the flags as you go. And then we'll talk about how this cluster's defenders could have broken the attack path at a bunch of different points. Okay, enough agenda, let's get to it. Rock. Okay, so Alana and I wanted to share some history first. Uh, back in 2020, the lockdowns were in place and New Year's Eve was set to be a lot less fun than usual. So DEF CON decided to create an online New Year's Eve event where people could participate in contests and events. Um, a bunch of us at InGuardians decided we'd like to create a capture the flag contest that would be centered around a Kubernetes cluster. And we wanted to give people a chance to compete on the one hand and also to just build experience on a complex multi-stage scenario instead of just a single little bit. Um, also at that time, there weren't much in the way of Kubernetes talks happening at DEF CON yet. So we wanted to start the contest partly to draw more researcher attention to Kubernetes. So we'd see more DEF CON Kubernetes talks. And we themed the first one on the classic movie, Hackers. We had a great experience with this contest and did it for DEF CON in 2021 as well. But we're gonna talk to you today about the DEF CON 2022 contest. So we themed this last year's uh, DEF CON Kubernetes CTF on the now classic movie, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Um, if any of you are like me and thinking, what do you mean it's a classic? Uh, it, apparently it's been around for a little while and I'm now getting old. Um, uh, it helps to understand who the characters are. So if you haven't seen the movie just yet, please pause this recording to go watch it. Okay, so for those of you in the room right now, don't worry, you can all watch it on your phones. We're gonna all wait, right? Now, while some of you are still watching the movie, we'd also like to share that we have a tradition of doing an annual second run of the contest scenario, where we give your team a cluster and give you an answer key you can use to learn without the pressure of competing. Okay, I can see you've all finished the movie now. Um, let's talk about the plot. Uh, we don't have to go too far into the plot. First, you've got this couple pictured front and center, Ramon and Scott. They're told that if they are to date, Scott will have to defeat all of Ramona's evil exes in battle. The CTF players discover that each namespace they move through is named for an evil ex. Those who didn't see the movie ended up reading Wikipedia to get their names. Now that's cheating. So we're about to show you a speed run, a solution for 2022's Kubernetes CTF. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so let's switch over to our demo. All right, so what we did was we started off by giving each team an IP address, and what I did here was I just took that IP address and we've thrown it in our Etsy host file as DEF CON CTF, just to make things a little bit sim simpler and easy to follow. So then I ran a simple Nmap scan, and we get back two ports, 30080 and 30156. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those and I'm gonna navigate to them in a browser. And here we go, we have 30080. And we see this welcome page, and it says, welcome to the DEF CON 30 Kubernetes Capture the Flag. And then it gives a little bit of background on the CTF and the theme. And lastly, it says, remember, enumeration is key. And that's really important for any CTF. So now let's switch over to 30156. And we get this one line of text. It says, my name is Matthew Patel, and I'm Ramona's first evil ex-boyfriend. Now this reminds us less of a web application and more of an API. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this 30156 and let's give it a curl. And we see that same thing. My name is Matthew Patel and I'm Ramona's first evil ex-boyfriend. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an enumer a directory enumeration using Derby, just with a simple directory list that comes with uh, Derby off the bat. So we get back this slash Matthew path. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna curl that and it says, requires three parameters, username, password, and command. So let's curl that again, but let's add in the parameters with some generic values for username, password, and ID. 
or, and command. And it tells us user does not exist. This is great because if it tells us when a user doesn't exist, that means it'll tell us when a user does exist as well. So we can enumerate the username parameter for, the, for a valid user. But before I do that, I'm going to create a word list to enumerate with using a tool called cool. And it's just going to scrape this DEF CON CTF uh, welcome page for any website words, and it's going to take them all, make them lowercase, sort them, and put them in this website words.txt. So we cat that out, and we can see we have a bunch of words from the welcome site, and even names too, all lowercase. So next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use wfuzz, and I'm gonna use that with the website words file that we just created, and then I'm gonna filter out for user does not exist in the, uh, in the body of the request. And we're gonna do this against slash Matthew, and in our username field, we're gonna put fuzz, and that tells our tool where we want to enumerate usernames or try different possibilities for usernames. So we do that, it's really quick, only 34 requests, and we get our, first, our, we get our username back. It's Scott. So let's try a curl request with Scott as our username now and see what we get back. So we got slash Matthew, username Scott, and then some generic values, and it says password is not correct. So next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do wfuzz again with the same website words, but this time I'm gonna filter out for password is not correct. And then we're going to use our Scott username, and we're gonna put fuzz in the password. And that way our tool knows that we want to enumerate in the password field or try different possibilities for the passwords. So we run that. Again, it's really quick and we get back Pilgrim. So now we have our username and we have our password of Scott and Pilgrim. So let's curl that with Scott and Pilgrim. And it says the command has to be base64 encoded. And that's an easy fix. We just base64 our command. And then we can take that value and we can throw it at the end of our curl request. Great, we get back a UID and a GID. So this means we have remote code execution. So now at this point, let's see. I'm just gonna create a quick little bash script called run.sh, and what this is gonna do is it's going to take that curl command and it's gonna run it with whatever parameters that we feed it. So let's do a quick little run.sh um, and list out the slash directory. So we list that out and we see that we have a flag item. Now this can be either a directory or it can be a file, so let's try and ls that. And it is a directory and we got a flag.txt in there, so let's cat that out and see what's inside. Bam, we get a movie quote. It says, this is impossible, how can it be? Open your eyes, maybe you'll see. Congratulations, here's your flag. And then it gives us this flag crash in the boy's collateral damage. Then it tells us that we're gonna to need to gain two secrets from a vault instance in the next namespace. And those secrets are called flag and next. So now at this point, I'm gonna skip ahead because I had to go through three shells in order to get an interpreter shell. So here we have our interpreter and we're gonna interact with our session. And we see, we run a host name and we get we are in the Matthew Patel microservice pod. Now, the great thing about this is now we get back standard error, which can be really useful to know what's going on as, attack, as an attacker. So next, we wanna start running kube control commands with whatever service account token has been automatically mounted into this pod. By default, Kubernetes pods always have a service account token mounted in this var run secrets subdirectory. It also puts a certificate authority cert for the API server and a text file with the name of the namespace we are in. Now, remember, the flag said that we'd need to do something with vault in the next namespace. So let's display that namespace file. Looks like we're in Matthew hyphen Patel. So we're not, gonna try you, we're not gonna show you trying a bunch of possibilities, but essentially the teams figure out that the next namespace is going to be Lucas-Lee, the next X. 
So let's run a kube control command that uses the service account token and ask the Kubernetes API server what this service account token can do in the Lucas Lee namespace. So here we go, we're using our cert authority and then we'll reference Lucas Lee, auth can I list. It looks like we're allowed to list pods and get details about them. And we're also allowed to exec into a pod named Lucas Lee Vault Zero. So let's exec into that pod and see if we can get another flag and maybe use its service count token. So we exec into it and run a hostname command to confirm we've landed in the right pod, Lucas Lee Vault Zero. Now we're gonna pull down a meterpreter from a web server we're hosting, run it, and then switch to that new meterpreter session in Metasploit. There we go, and we can verify hostname, Lucas Lee Vault Zero. Now the hint told us to get the values of the flag and next secrets out of Vault. The teams probably did some Googling, but they find that they can run a Vault CLI command to ask for these secrets. At first, we get an error message about asking an HTTP server for HTTPS. So, we can set an environment variable to explicitly use HTTP. Then we ask for the flag key now and get a movie quote about skater Lucas Lee bailing out on a grind trick. It says, wow, he totally bailed. So we've defeated our first evil X, and that's Chris Evans' character. So now we're gonna ask for the next key and get a hint about another goal. It says we have to trick Todd Ingram into drinking half and half, and it also says that whenever you offer him food or drink, he checks with a service called Envy about it. This is going to turn out to be a kind of monkey in the middle scenario, but we're not there yet. So there you see, it tells you what to do. And at this point, we're gonna grab a copy of Coop Control and try to use whatever service count token is mounted into this pod. So we set up Coop Control, we asked it what this pod's token can do in the Todd Ingram namespace. And it turns out the answer is basically nothing. So this output is what you get for any authenticated user. So next, we're gonna check what this pod's token can do in our current namespace, Lucas Lee. And it looks like it's allowed to list out secrets, but not use the get verb to see their contents. So let's list out the secrets in this namespace, and we see that there is a flag that tells us to now go get the stunt team. The point of this flag in this scenario is for people to figure out something that isn't so intuitive. If you can list secrets, then you can get their contents, as long as you ask for the contents of all the secrets rather than just one secret. See, we try asking for the flag secret and get an unauthorized message, because we're not allowed to do that. So now we're gonna ask for a list of all secrets, and we're gonna ask for that list in YAML format. Now we can see here that there is a secret data in here, like this token that we just highlighted. And let's run that again and do some fancy grepping to get the contents of the flag secret. So that gets us a flag, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this again, but this time we're base64 decoding it, and we get back the flag, nothing without my stunt team. Another movie quote. Next, let's get the stunt team token secret. That turns out to be a service account token, so we can parse that out and put it in a file called stunt team token. So here we are doing that, and you can cat that out, and there we go. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go ahead and create a quick little kube control alias to use the stunt team token. And we're gonna call it kube stunt team. And next what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the API server what this token is allowed to do in the next namespace, Todd Ingram. This one lets us, this one is going to let us list, list and get pods. But more impressively, it's going to let us exec into a pod called Spilled Coffee, so remember that. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay so that we can keep our demo going. Switch. Cool. Thanks. Um, let's see. Where's my, cool. So what we just did was we took the, um, 
We landed in the, we've landed in the stunt team pod, or rather, sorry, we got that stunt team token from a secret, because we were allowed to list out secrets, and listing out secrets of Kubernetes gets you the contents of the secrets. And um, we actually found that on a pen test, um, and we checked in with the Kubernetes, uh, um, uh, 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 what's it called, the PSC that basically tells you, like, okay, is this a CVE or not? And it's like, this is kind of works as intended, but it also feels a little bit like a vuln. Um, and yeah, that's kind of tricky. But um, this is what the people had to figure out for this flag. So once they've got that stunt team token, wrote it out to a file, set up that kube stunt team alias, um, then they've got the, um, then they can basically say, okay, what can I do with this? Um, just like we've been doing so far. So they say, in the Todd Ingram namespace, because that's where I'm supposed to go next, what am I allowed to do? And it said, I'm sorry, I'm backtracking a little bit. <laughs> um, it said, you know, you're allowed to get pods, you're allowed to list pods, um, you're allowed to exec into one. So we get a list of pods first, and we see a few pods. We see an NV Adams pod and a spilled coffee pod, and we see this one called Todd Ingram Consume. And remember, our next target is Todd Ingram. So we're going to write down these IP addresses. Uh, take a sec, uh, write them. OK, just imagine we're writing them down over here. We're going to write down these IP addresses for the pods. So we can interact with them later. And then we're also, as long as Kubernetes is going to let us ask for information about the pods, we're going to ask the API server to tell us um, information about it. And if you're allowed to, if you're allowed to get or list, then you can learn quite a bit. So we'll ask it, we'll use kube control describe and say, hey, describe this pod to me. And we're looking for a few things. The first thing we're looking for is just this port number. Um, and that part of the demo went by a little fast, so I'm going to pause it again right when that comes up. So we're looking for that port number. And the reason is that way, like, OK, I'm supposed to attack this pod. I'm going to try to connect to it on the network. If I look at the port number in its description, I don't have to bother port scanning it or anything. Um, so cool. I know it's 8001. I'm going to use that same describe on the spilled coffee pod, on the one that I'm allowed to exec into, learn a little bit more about it. And the first thing I want to do that I notice is, hey, there's a flag mounted in there. And the flag is being supplied by a secret called flag. You must, you must monkey in the middle Todd to envy. And that's another hint that, you know, similar to the one we've already gotten. Um, and I'm going to run that describe again and look at a different part of the output um, and see there's that pod. It's named Spilled Coffee. It's in the Todd Ingram namespace. And it's got some labels. It's got a label app set to Spilled Coffee. And, and that label is going to turn out to be really important to doing our monkey in the middle. So let's go a little further. So we'll clear our screen. We're going to exec into that Spilled Coffee pod because we saw we could. So now we're in a new pod. That new pod's going to have its own service count token. We're going to do what we've been doing, basically set up interpreters everywhere we go just to, make, just to get some C2 and to make it a little bit easier to upload files and whatnot. And we'll get into that, um, we'll get into that pod with an interpreter shell. So we were already in. We just kind of started a more useful shell. And we remember that there was a flat, that there was something mounted into slash flag. So we take a look at it. We see another flag. This one says, incorrigible, don't know the meaning, meaning of the word. Any of you who watched the Scott Pilgrim movie or remember it fondly are probably having a lot of fun with these flags. The rest of us, um, we have to go and rewatch the movie or watch it for the first time. Um, you'll get everything just fine without it, but the movie's awesome. So, um, so we have, uh, so the first thing we did was we set up, we're, we're in this pod, we've got coop control, we're gonna run a coop control get pods Turns out we have to set up this long alias that we've been doing so far, saying where the, uh, to use the service count tokens in the pod and so on. And we'll do our get pods. And uh, when we run kube control get pods, on the one hand, it says you're not allowed to list pods. Um, but a cool thing is it tells us what service count we've got. And in this spilled coffee pod, the service count token is named for Julie. This is Aubrey Plaza's character in the movie. Um, and so we've got Julie's service count token. We ask, what am I allowed to do with that? And it says that Julie's allowed to list and get, so read all the services in the namespace, but also allowed to update and patch them, allowed to change them. Changing the service is going to basically be key to our monkey in the middle. So what we're going to do is say, OK, let me get a list of services. I've got this, I've got one service. It's that NV one. And the whole trick with these services 
is that when you, a service is, a, is an internal load balancer in Kubernetes. And so in, uh, uh, a service creates a DNS name and an IP address. And that DNS name has a really predictable name. And it's the same one that we saw in our first hint that said Todd checks with env.toddingram.service.cluster.local. So basically, Todd Ingram checks with, the, checks with this service. So we look at the service. And remember, Julie is allowed to read the service, but also to change it. So the service says, it has this label selector, app set to is it vegan. So what that means is, everything going into this load balancer, into this internal load balancer, this service, is going to go out. And it's going to go out to pods, not by name, but by what their labels are. It's going to go out to whatever pods have their app label set to is it vegan. OK. Um, also, we get a port. Traffic comes in on port 80, goes out to port 8,000. Cool. So I'm going to clear my screen. And I'm going to go and curl that Todd pod. The Todd pod was the one that we're supposed to, they were supposed to monkey in the middle. Um, or Sorry, that we're supposed to attack, and then we're going to end up monkey in the middling. So I'm going to use that Todd pod's IP address. And I get this quote from the movie that says, I can see in your mind's eye you try to put half and half in one of these coffees to take away my vegan powers. You know, and hey, if you want to actually try attacking me, um, connect to slash consume and supply some food, like half and half, because we're supposed to tell it to drink half and half. And so what we do is we talk to that consume half and half, and Todd says, I won't consume that. Now, we can go talk to that service, and we can ask, we can talk to that service. There's a service at... Uh, Envy.toddingram, right, that, that DNS name we've been using. And it answers back and says, hi, I'm a service and I answer questions about is it vegan. So I want you to pass is it vegan and then a food parameter. And the food should be a base 64 serialized object. Name, uh, you know, name and a bunch of other fields. So OK, so we can do that. So we create an object for half and half. And our object for half and half is name, half and half, and it's going to have dairy set to true and meat set to false and so on. And we're going to create this object in a, we're going to create this, this quick little um, JSON object and then we're going to base64 encode it the way this thing's asked us to. And so when we do, we can pass this on to that Envy service and Envy answers back that no, it's not vegan. Half and half is made with milk. It's not vegan. Keep this out of your coffee. And so we know that Todd is basically consulting that service. And what we want to do is monkey in the middle. We want to answer the is it vegan question. And we're going to, what the teams end up figuring out is this thing answers no. What if it answered yes? And so they're going to end up creating their own replacement web server to listen for that incoming request, uh, incoming question about like, hey, is this vegan? And just be like, yeah, it's vegan, sure. Um, so let's do that. So the first thing is we're going to modify that service. Because our service account, Julie, is allowed to change services, we're just going to change one thing. We're going to change that label. We're going to say where to send the traffic. So we get a copy of the service in YAML. We get the, the basically a manifest, the description from the API server. And we take that thing, and we go and basically take this, this app, is it vegan label that things are supposed to go to. And remember we, we, when we did our spilled coffee describe, we saw spilled coffee at its app label set to spilled coffee. So we're going to use a little sed in place command that changes is it vegan to spilled coffee in that service.yaml. And then we'll just tell the API server, hey, I'm Julie. I'm allowed to change services. I'd like to change this service using this as my new manifest. And so I say I'd like to change the service. It says service has changed. I can do a little get services and see that the NV service now says app spilled coffee. So the next thing I need to do is basically set up, so now in, my, in this spilled coffee pod, I had one shell. I'm gonna, because I'm using Metasploit, I can ask for two shells. So I'm going to use one shell, and I'm going to set up a netcat listener to listen on port 8000, because that's where the service says it sends things. And in, on port 8000, I'm just, gonna, I'm just using netcat. Like the teams probably went and set up, found a way to set up their own web server or modify the web server that was in there, whatever. We're making it really easy. We'll use netcat. We're going to answer just yes. And the other three lines are just the minimum headers we need to be able to send that back to something that's, that's talking HTTP to us. And so then we're going to go over to our other shell that's in spilled coffee and hit curl and ask Todd to consume the half and half. Todd will ask the Envy service, receive our yes answer instead of the actual answer. And boom, we get another flag. So we get this. Um, 
Uh, we sent in consume half and half, and we got back. Todd drinks the coffee with the half and half, as in the movie. Sorry, spoilers. Um, and says, you know, and we get the freeze vegan police, and the vegan police take away all of Todd's special powers. Oh yeah, in the movie, if you're vegan, you basically get Jedi powers. Um, the quote is something like, um, didn't you know being vegan just makes you better than most people? Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Haven't tried that yet. So, the, uh, so anyway, we've got the service count token that we've been given, and we've been given a flag. So we're going to take that service count token and cut it out to a file so we can use it later on. And I'm going to clear the screen. And we're going to set up a kube control alias that uses that token. And now we've got this Todd Ingram token. Let's see what we can do with it. So we'll ask, what can we do with it in the current namespace, in the Todd Ingram namespace? And it basically, same as Alana was doing earlier, says kind of nothing. This is, your, this is the normal stuff you get when you can't do anything. Well, the next X is named Roxy Richter, so let's ask what we can do in that namespace. Also, Bupkis. Okay, cool. So at this point, the teams may try a bunch of things, they may ask for a hint, but what they eventually come to is they think, enumerate, 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 wait, in this namespace, there was another pod. There were three pods. I've interacted with Todd Ingram. Um, I've been in spilled coffee. There's an envy pod. It's time to go attack that envy pod. And so they end up attacking the envy pod. Um, uh, the person who played envy uh, goes on to play Captain Marvel. Um, so attacks the, the, the envy pod. Basically reaches out to that thing, that is it vegan um, thing that we reached out to before, except instead of the service, we gotta ask the pod, because we rerouted the service. So we're gonna ask that pod, hey, uh, you know, just, is it vegan? It says, hey, you need to send me a base 64 encoded. This one's, this is the special part. No JS serialized object containing a name. And the cool thing is, this may have taken the player, the players a little while to realize, but there's actually the most popular object serialization library for Node.js is node hyphen serialize. You get the good name, you end up getting all of the users, all the developers. This thing has had a remote code execution vulnerability in it for now six years, um, five years at the time, uh, that's not getting fixed. And so the players would maybe go and learn about that, um, find out that that package has an RCE, and they can go and look at, you know, there's a link in that page from the person who found it, and they show you the vault, they show you the exploit. And the exploit is basically if you send, if you send this kind of serialized, of, of serialized object, kind of an attack, it's a function, then it will run a command line. It'll run a, pro, a uh, it'll run a, it will run a command. And the command that he made was ls minus l, like list, you know, list a directory. Um, so we're gonna, what we, what we're gonna do is just take that, we're gonna edit a file, and we're gonna make our own version of that. Instead of running ls minus l, we'll write something that says, hey, use wget to pull down a meterpreter from the same place all the other flags have been pulling it down, make it executable, and run it. And so that's what we're doing. Same exact, basically copy and pasting like good script kitties. Um, script kitties ex exist in Kubernetes too. Um, and so we've got this, so we've taken that, we're gonna base64 encode it, and once we base64 encode it, we can pass it in to that is it vegan as that food parameter. And when we do, boom, we get a new interpreter session, so we're now inside of that NV pod. So you should see that some of the flags are getting a little more complex um, as we go. So we're in that, we, we got, and, um, we got a, a pod, it was called NV Atoms, and we can go and look um, in the file system, we see, a, we see a flags. Um, so we see this flag and it says, hey, next, time, next find a configuration item named Roxy Richter flag. Um, so the teams end up, you know, kind of eventually thinking about, like, they're gonna, they're, they know they have to find a configuration item. Okay, got, grab a copy of kube control, use the token that's in here. We're going after the Roxy Richter X. So when we do that auth can I, we see config maps. We're allowed to get them and list them. Okay, well, let's list them. So a config map is a kind of, is a way that Kubernetes pushes configuration into a pod. So yeah, that's what it turns out to, uh, this flag's a little simpler, but a lot of the teams won't know about config maps yet, and so that's kind of the learning experience and the trick. So they see the config map has a flag, it says this is a league game, and it says next, 
you shoot exec into this ninth, into ninth circle in the Katanyagi twins namespace. And we're getting really close to the end of the, of the CTF at this point. Um, so we do a little bit of, uh, we did a little bit of um, shell magic to put spaces, to put white space in here. But now we're supposed to basically go after these Katanyagi twins. We ask, what is this, what, what is our current token allowed to do there? And it says your current token is allowed to um, get descriptions about pods, but not to list them. Um, and it's also allowed to exec into them. But not all pods, just one name ninth circle. Well, cool, I know the name of a pod now. It'll have to list them. So let me take that ninth circle and let me run describe on it. And the reason we're running describe because we're supposed to enumerate, enumerate, enumerate. So we see that there's a flag file in there, but there's also this funky directory called manifests. And this is where things start getting pretty fun because this is gonna lead us towards container breakout. So we've got this manifest directory. And the manifest directory that's being mounted in is being mounted, what's being mounted in there is a volume, is a directory, and that volume's name is Etsy Kubernetes Manifest. And if we look further down in this, in this file, we find that that, that that thing that's being mounted in is the uber dangerous host path mount, that thing where you can mount in a directory from, the, from outside the container from the host file system the container, that the container is running in. And so the directory in question, sometimes it's not very dangerous, but in this case, it's a super dangerous one. It's Etsy Kubernetes Manifests, and that contains, um, that contains the, uh, that can, can, if, you, if you write a pod definition into there, then the kubelet will just go and start that pod, and then Kubernetes will actually go and see that the kubelet's done that and create a kind of mirror for it. Um, there are certain things you can't do with one of those, but you can do a lot as we're about to see. So first, we're gonna go exec into that uh, ninth circle pod that we just described that has that funky volume mount. We'll go get our flag. So, um, and, it, and, we'll look at the, and we'll look at inside that flag directory, we see a next file. And the next file told the teams, hey, you're supposed, to, we want you to access the node file system, but you're not allowed to use kernel exploits because any kernel exploit or any kernel exploit has the, has the potential to break you out of container and we don't want the teams to use to do something that easy. Um, so we say access the node file system without kernel exploits. And so they're in this ninth circle pod, clear in the screen, and all they've got to do is if they write a pod definition into manifests, that pod will get created. So this is their first chance where they're not moving into a new pod, they're actually getting to create their own. If you can create your own pod, you can set all kinds of parameters on it. And one of the parameters we're going to set is, let me use that pointer for a second, because I think we don't highlight it. Um, except I just used the, that's not the right thing. OK. So one of the parameters we're going to set is this thing that says privileged. We're going to make it a, we're going to say in that pod, create a privileged container, which is one that gets all kinds of special powers, including the ability to like mount the host's file system, see all the devices, insert kernel modules, like you basically never want to see these in a cluster. I'm going to say I'd like to create a, a privileged pod, and I'm also going to say that I want this pod to have one part that's, to have the container that's in here, have one thing that's not kind of containerized. I want to have it use the process ID namespace from the, uh, from the node instead of, you know, instead of getting its own. So in those containers, you run a PS, you get a list of just a few processes. But if you add this parameter, you get all the processes on the, on the actual Linux system that's running it. And honestly, what I'm doing here is setting up, um, there's this great sticker and there's a tweet that goes with it, but, oh, it's on this laptop, um, by uh, Duffy Cooley and Ian Coldwater that basically says, run this command and you get a privilege pod with this PID, uses this PID namespace. And this is kind of one of the fastest routes to container breakout. So, we're creating a, a pod with a container like that, and we have it reach out to a netcat listener. So um, with stage, we have a netcat listener already staged, and when we get a connection on that, it's from this new pod. And this pod that we asked to be called Pwn is called Pwn, and then the name of the node it's on, this node's US West. And so now what we do is we run an NS enter command that says, I'd like to, I'd let, so namespace enter. What you're saying is I'd like to start a shell and that shell is gonna have all the same namespaces that kind of define this container, except that I'd like now to make the mount namespace, the files, the way, its view of the file system, not be its own, but instead be 
the one that belongs to process ID one, the one that belongs to the, to the node as a whole. So we're kind of, again, breaking the container a little bit more. And so when we run this NS enter command, um, we've, we're creating a shell there, and that shell, um, and that shell, uh, we, we're staging up a new meterpreter in there. And we'll background that. And now we're out on the node. And so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna clear the screen, and now we're on the node, and what we're supposed to do is find the last flag. We need to find one for Gideon Graves. And so what we're gonna do real quick is grab a copy of Parades. Parades is a pen test tool that we made it in Guardians, because we do a bunch of Kubernetes pen tests, so whenever we have useful stuff to automate, we write into this thing. It's open source, you can come work on it too, and um, it's a good excuse to learn Go. So we're gonna run Parades, and Parades has ASCII art, just like every good uh, text-based attack tool has. So we go to Parades, we go, to, we go and run Parades, we see the ASCII art, and it says, hey, I, I'm, I, Parades has realized it's running on the node instead of in a container. And when it does that, it'll go and raid the node's file system for privilege. So the first thing it does is it finds the kubelets kubeconfig file that has authentication credentials basically for the node, um, for the kubelet, which kind of has to run everything on the node, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of privilege. But also, it's allowed to walk the file system. So in addition to getting the kubelet cert, it goes around and finds service count tokens for every pod that's running on the node. So some of the ones we've already gotten, but some of the control plane components as well. And that's great. And it takes those service count tokens, we'll show you later, and kind of, and, and writes them, you know, caches them for you to use in Parades. Um, and then it also finds secrets. So if it finds any secrets, if they're service count tokens, it gets them. If they aren't service count tokens, if they're TLS keys, it gets those. And otherwise, it basically says, hey, if you want to see the contents of the secret, just run this command. It gives you the path out to that secret. So the Gideon Graves Chaos Theater flag secret, it gave us, and we were able to, and we can just copy and paste. And did I back up in, my, in the demo somehow? Yep, sure did. Okay, so Parati said ls this file just ls this directory to get the getting graves flag. And so let's copy paste. So we've got a background Parades, and we see a flag, we see a directory with a flag and a message. So we get our last flag and we get the message basically that says, hey, you did it, game over. Um, this thing's themed on, this movie's kind of themed on both a comic book and a video game at the same time. It's really weird. So the other thing we just want to show you in the demo real quick is when Parades was grabbing all those service count tokens, was showing them all to you, it was also storing them. It has a cool feature where you can basically say, I want to run a kube control command. You know how we were told you're not allowed to do that? Parades basically can say, ah, you've stored 13 different, 13 different service count tokens and the kubelets. We'll try your kube control command with all 14 of those credentials uh, right in a row automated. So anyway, it's kind of fun. Um, we're going to go at this point and jump back to our slides. Cool. So now we're going to talk about how you defend against that attack path. Um, for each step on the path, we have a quick reference slide that summarizes what you just saw. Then we're going to have a slide or two about defenses. And we're going to try to go a little fast because I think I ate a little more time on our demo. So remember when we got the first flag? We used Derby to find a slash math path. And then we used wfuzz to find a valid username, and then we used wfuzz again to find a valid password. Once we had those, we could run commands in a container in the cluster. We made one of those commands run a reverse shell for us. So if we're defending this cluster, but we don't know in advance what vulnerabilities it will have, what should we do? We definitely should use network policies, which are Kubernetes native firewall rules, to stop the Matthew Patel pod from sending us a reverse shell. That's an easy no-brainer that even makes sense in the pre-container world, right? Servers should serve. They shouldn't make arbitrary connections out to the internet. Here's the other thing. This CTFs cluster used node port services to make the web server and the web service accessible to the internet. We can also do that with a Kubernetes ingress, a type of layer seven proxy. Ingress Nginx is one of the most popular open source ingresses and it comes with the mod security um, web application for firewall. Once you install it, it's easy to configure. The YAML on this slide makes all traffic headed into the Matthew Patel service go through a mod security WAF. It configures the WAF to use the OWASP mod security core rule set. For the next stage of the attack, we use the service count token that was in the Matthew Patel microservice pod to exec into a vault pod. From there, we were able to use vault to get a flag and an next step. 
Okay, so for this attack, you could audit the cluster ahead of time to see if any service accounts have more privilege than they should have, like the ability to exec into pods. For this, you're looking at RBAC, role-based access control, which Kubernetes uses for authorization. To audit this, you look at what roles exist and what service accounts, users, and groups have those roles. You can ask who has what roles by getting a list of role bindings, and then you can investigate what those roles do. You can even find a few visualizer tools on GitHub, and they can make RBAC easier to explore graphically. Here's another thing. Remember how we kept finding service account tokens in every pod and using them? They're mounted into the pods by default, but you can turn that off pod by pod. So you could also break this stage of the attack by making sure that pod definitions turn off service account token mounting. We'll come back later to show you how to enforce that across the entire cluster. So what happened next in the attack path? In that vault pod, you had found Lucas Lee's service account token. The API server told you that Lucas Lee could list secrets, and once you realized that listing secrets would get you any secrets contents, you got the stunt team service account token from a secret. So to defend against this one, first and foremost, you make sure that everyone understands that listing secrets in Kubernetes gets you their contents. But also you can use an admission controller like Kyverno or Gatekeeper to stop anyone from creating a role that lets users or service accounts list secrets. This slide shows a screenshot from Kyverno's website with a pre-written policy to do exactly that. So our next step was to use this stunt team service account token to exec into the spilled coffee pod. That got us a flag and a service account token for Julie, a character who was played by Aubrey Plaza in the movie. Okay, so similar defense here, do an RBAC audit. Also, remember, you can make it so that the pods don't have service account tokens in, them in the first place. You can use one of the free admission controllers like Kyverno for this. The screenshot on this slide shows Kyverno's pre-written policy. If you apply this policy to a cluster, Kyverno will automatically modify every new pod to deactivate service account token mounting in that pod. Let's see, so in the next step in the attack path, we found the Julie service account was allowed to read and modify services. Um, we offered Todd half and half. We remember that he was gonna check in with the NV service with an HTTP request. And the NV service would send his request to pods that have their app label set to, is it vegan? So we use Julie's service count token to modify that NV service so it sends Todd's requests to pods with their app label set to spilled coffee. And since this was HTTP, the, the workloads don't have any idea that anything's changed. Um, uh, let's see, on the attack, um, when we connected to Todd's, to Todd's pod, asked it to consume, um, to use the consume path to, to ask it to drink half and half, um, we connected to the original service endpoint Envy. We saw what kind of answer it gave. We guessed what kind of answer we should give instead. We modified the service to send traffic to our own pod to spilled coffee by changing that app label. We set up a netcat lister to answer Todd's incoming request with yes, no matter what it was. We connected to Todd, asked him to consume the half and half. He checks with the Envy service, gets our incorrect answer, ends up defeated. So what do we do, what could you do to proactively defend for this? Everything we're doing here is basically, we're focusing on what could you do if you didn't know anything was vulnerable. So first, you could audit and harden RBAC, um, like we've talked about. You could deactivate the service count token mounting, sure. Both of those would, both of those would do it. Um, what else could you do? Um, if any of you are screaming out, like, what about HTTPS, we've got one more recommendation for you the cluster operators could use a service mesh like Istio or Linkerd or console um, that would put MTLS between all the pods and so Todd would know that Todd wasn't talking to the right thing even though the, even though the workload wouldn't have to be rewritten to, to, handle, um, to handle TLS. So next in the attack path, we attacked Envy's pod. We were using a custom node, that pod was using custom Node.js code that used a library with a long-standing RCE in it the vulnerability is node serialize, um, an object serialization library. So how do you defend against that one? You're not gonna know the vulnerabilities there, or are you? So you can do image scanning. And so image scanning, you can use tools, open source tools like Claire or Gripe, um, or your cloud provider or your image registry might actually provide image scanning as well because they're looking for um, well-known, you know, for, well, um, for known vulnerable libraries. Um, also, we're at RSA, this is where anyone waiting for an S-bomb mention uh, can find some relief. Uh, if you've got your fictional RSA bingo card, you're looking for the S-bomb buzzword, you win. Um, 
ASBOM on the NVPods image would contain node serialize, the vulnerable library. Okay, next we got a hint about a configuration item. The key to moving on was something in a config map, so we pulled the config map. So for defense, we basically have RBAC, we basically have, you know, audit RBAC, turn off that service count token mounting. You could also say, wait a second, that looks sensitive, and if it was something sensitive, it should have been in a Kubernetes secret, or maybe even a secret manager like Open Source Vault. Um, let's see, the next thing we did was we found out we were allowed to exec into a pod called Ninth Circle, and we learned about it. So our defense here, same thing, audit our back, make it sure you're, so nothing's allowed to exec. You really should be seeing pod execs. Um, and then final flag, um, we realized when we were looking at that, at that last, spill, at that last uh, ninth circle pod, that it had a host path mount that was mounting in manifest directory. And so we created a privileged pod, we mounted the nodes file systems, and we read it across the nodes file system with Paradis in an automated way to go find that flag secret. So what do we do for defense? The first is we could use an oldie but goodie. We can use OG file integrity monitoring. Um, that directory actually shouldn't be changing. We should be having things dynamically put in that directory, so that's easy. The other thing we can do is we should, be, we should think about using pod security standards or another admission controller like the ones we've talked about, like Kyberno and Gatekeeper, that can stop us from, that can stop us from having that Kalanyagi twins pod um, that, was a lot, that had a host path mount in it. So that's what we've got on defense. Um, like we said before, we're gonna take questions in the hallway afterwards. We're gonna meet you all. We're gonna give you Kubernetes specific stickers or Guardian stickers if you want. Um, and we're gonna, happy to talk um, Kubernetes for a while. We do have a quick, what could you do to detect this? So to detect these attacks, the very first thing you have to do, if you all remember like Lo um, back in the day, there was like Windows event logging and the minimum, the maximum log size was so small you'd never see anything. Kubernetes is kind of even worse. The, the logging of all this stuff happening is not happening by default, but it's incredibly easy to turn on. So here's your recipe for turning it on. You write an audit log config file to say what you'd like to audit. There's a, there's a sample on the Kubernetes documentation site that's very easy, um, that's, that's, per that, that's uh, really, really inclusive. Um, you change command line flags to say it should use the config file, and then you modify the API server pod. So we've got some quick screenshots of how you do that. Um, so you write this audit log file, and you can find that at the URL that's, on, that's, on, that's in the slides. Just write it to the control plane nodes file system. You go and modify the API server's manifest from that wonderful Etsy Kubernetes manifest directory, and you tell it to use to use that audit policy file, and you tell it where to write the logs. Um, and you also, next two screenshots, basically say that you want to mount the config file into the API server's pod, and you want to mount the log directory from the node into the API server's pod. And so that's what gets you, that's what gets you logging. Once you've done that, I just wanna say like, what could we have detected with audit logging? We kinda could have detected a whole bunch of this. So the, um, the exec, just look for API events that are pod exec. We've got a picture of that on the next slide. That, that listing secrets, look for the API event where we're list secrets. Changing the service, that was update service. L like each of these things are things we shouldn't actually see in a cluster that isn't your dev cluster. So we could basically say look for stuff that shouldn't be happening. Um, so once you've got that audit turning on, I know this is incredibly tiny text, please find these slides online at RSA site. But um, what's highlighted here is basically, if we look at the audit logs, it's a bunch of, it's basically long JSON, very easy to parse, and you can basically parse out, um, you can basically parse out for creating pod execs. That would be the pod exec. And um, so, cool. I'm, I've hit time. So, whole summary of this slide, what's your, what's your overarching lesson? Small configuration changes make all the difference. Small bad configuration, CNN headline. Good configuration, you get to bypass all of this. So anyway, finally, please take a photo of that slide, follow us on Twitter, and hit our website to learn more. Thank you, we'll see you in the hallway.